Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Philosophy Clock with Eche Fatum. Today's topic is value theory. We're going to start off with a video, and then we're going to get into the conversation. I'm going to call Mr. Eche Fatum, and we will learn about philosophy. I will phone him. Let's put it on U.S. East. He's in Europe. Switzerland, even. Hello. Hello there. How have you been? Uh, um, I've had a bit of a bike accident. We Other saw. That, I'm that was intense. Do you have the link of that handy? We could just open with that if you want to. <laughs> it's an icebreaker. <laughs> Let me see. I might still have it. Let me check. Hmm. Don't see it. Oh man, the view of your cycling route looked incredible. We got it. Fantastic. Okay, Eche Fatum is someone who's been on the path of philosophy for a long time. He's also an outdoorsman. He's uh, known as a philosopher because he surfs and does philosophy, sometimes in tandem. And here we have him cycling. We'll just show the the nice video footage here. Oh. He's got a head cam here. And this is some pretty rough terrain. There is a trail, but it's got a bunch of rocks and what have you. So you need to be careful. And if you're going downhill, you can pick up some... Oh, it's and fortunately, he did not die. And he's here to discuss philosophy with us. Where is this? What country? Is it in your home country? Yeah, this is in Switzerland. Nice. And you have no injuries from this? Um, my knee and my elbow are still a bit hurt, but uh, nothing major. That's good. I'm glad you survived relatively unscathed. So yeah, we're talking about what today? Value theory? Yeah, we'll be talking about value theory in terms of economics, not in terms of philosophy, because value theory in philosophy would be ethics. And I think we already talked about that a bunch. Mm -hmm. Then again, ethics will kind of get into value theory because we value things more that we think of as good than we do value things we think of as bad. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's in there, but we'll be talking about how we arrive at the value of commodities for the most part. And this is uh, an introduction to the thinking and the problem that Marx was trying to solve at his time. And it's kind of a, let's say it's the less controversial part about um, Marx's thinking. So we start with that and then go into his somewhat more criticized views another time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to get it out of the way here, we're not here to proselytize or pander to anything in particular. Sometimes viewers or listeners will tune in to philosophy and we're talking about a certain philosopher and they're like, I can't believe you're a shield for this guy. We're just talking about what Marx contributed to the philosophical landscape, correct? We're not pitching it to people. <laughs> yes, you must uh, be a disciple. I think that what is seen as Marxist today is pretty um, far from what Marx was writing. So I think it's interesting to have a look at what he was writing, but we're really getting distorted by this view on what Marxism is or is supposed to be or what it's doing. So. Marx wasn't a Marxist as we understand it nowadays. Hmm. We have a starting off with a video. What is the inspiration for this? Ah, uh, this is um, Philomena Kank. She's, or that's her character name. She looks at different um, subjects in English life, and in this particular case, money and just has a moment of wonder about it. And it's always uh, 
good start to get into a topic. You know what I mean once you've seen the video. Okay. Then let us go with the video. Moments of wonder. Money is at the heart of the UK economy and many others. People fight for it, die for it, and put it in China pigs. So what is money? Put simply, money is the best way we have of telling how much money you've got. Over the centuries, many things have been used as money, including amber, wheat, eggs, traveler's checks, feathers, book vouchers, lobsters, beads, gold, leather, nectar points, rice, peas, mugs, and money. It was only the last of these that caught on. <laughs> Increasingly these days, money isn't something you can hold in your hand or bite on like a pirate, because it's stored in the imaginations of computers. And some of those computers are probably here in the Bank of England. <laughs> but that computer money is in crisis. UK government debt is now £1 trillion, and even Wonga can't help. So who can? Maybe a money expert can tell us what money is and what to do. Who are you, and why are you an expert on money? I'm Will Hutton, I'm an economist, and I'm an economic writer. What's the difference between economics and economics? <laughs> <laughs> It's just the way you pronounce the E. I think I prefer economics to economics, but uh, I've, I wonder what... You could put the same question to the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England and see whether they like the hardy or the softy. Hardy or softy? Economics, economics. Economics, economics. OK. <laughs> Money's all stored in computers these days, no. isn't it? No. How does a computer know what money looks like? How does it know? Well, the, uh, how does it recognise anything? How does a computer recognise, you know... Um, a, um, so you don't know? It's... Uh, you, know, you know in principle, but you don't know in detail, no. Do you know what I think's happened? Someone's told a computer what money looks like. They've gone up to a computer and they've said, this is like a five pound note. And then that computer's told the others. When you have a coin, <laughs> where is the, the money in that coin? If I were to take a coin and cut it open, could I take the money out of that coin and then it'd be empty? No, the coin is a token. The, the, the whole point about the coins in your pocket is they're universally accepted as a way of buying things. That's what the money is. How much does it cost to make a one pence piece? Because it's, if it's less than one pence, then it's a con, isn't it? But if it's like more than one pence, then do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's sort of not yeah. worth it then. Yeah, yeah. It costs a tiny amount of money to um, create a one penny piece. And that's what so the they're problem. ripping us off. It seems no one really knows what money is. It will always be an unsolvable problem, like a crossword or a Rubik's Cube. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be asking why there's more water in a tap than you'd expect. That's amazing. Is this woman trolling? Of course she's trolling, jeez Louise. Christmas That's good trolling though. The blank stare timing? It's very British humor, so if you're not British, some of it, it seems kind of off or weird or awkward. That's the point. It's supposed to be really goofy. She's low-key criticizing fiat currency. Yeah, because it's not really a tangible thing. So to human intuition, digital values of how much you own is weird. And if you look at things from a hunter-gatherer standpoint, you would have like meats or furs or something that you could point to that was in your lodge and you say, this is the value that I have. This is my money, so to speak. <clears throat> Good pick of a video. That was hilarious. Yeah, I think it's a good start into um, the mindset we'll be looking at. And this is kind of trying to figure out how we determine the value of something. 
and money in itself has no intrinsic value its only value is its exchangeability so we can use money to get other things we want to get with money but money is not gonna um, do anything for you on itself after watching that video i feel like a silly goose and it makes me just want to say well you could put coins to hold down paper as a paperweight so it does have intrinsic value <laughs> Not, not very much intrinsic value. We can say that. So where does Marx factor into this assessment of money? Because it seems like he was the origin point for communism kind of getting its name and being, a, I don't know if it's philosophy is the right word, but a structure for governments to rule. Uh. Well, Marx fit into this in the sense that he was living during a time where the economy was changing really rapidly. So we come from a time where most uh, labor was in agriculture and we went in this, into this industrial revolution where things got automated and all of a sudden, most jobs, most lab labor that was done was done in factories. So this was a big change for how life was for many people. And it came with some problems. And that's what was Marx was looking at. What are the problems that arise from this new system? I feel like we're almost in a a similar turning point with how people live, with how much automation we live with. Because say the Industrial Revolution was that first step toward automation where heavy machinery can help with a lot of what used to be physical human labor and lifting. So we can accomplish a lot more and people ended up working in factories more so than in fields. But now people are working more on computers than they are in factories. Well, it's kind of trending in that direction. Yeah, I think we're in a similar transition period, but the argument that um, automation will take away all our jobs has been around ever since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it will take a lot longer than we think it will. So there's always this um, this scarcity of jobs in a sense that we feel like we need to to be able to get a job because at some point there will no will be no more jobs to get around this will likely not be the case it will shift which areas will be working in because some things are just not um, we're not efficient enough to to be valuable to the market so there will be other areas where human labor is valuable because robots can't do anything or everything, I should rather say. They can, they can do a lot of things, a lot of things faster than us and they don't demand as much pay as humans do for the most part. Or vacation time. Yeah, true. So they're, they're good laborers, but they're we're not at a point where we should be scared that all the jobs will be taken away. There will always be a place for at least some people to either work on ro um, maintain robots or build robots or think about new robots. So mm. basically you're safe as long as you're doing anything robot related. Mm. Unless you're fighting robots and the robots want to fight against you, but yeah. Sure. So yeah, the Industrial Revolution hits, people live very differently. And I think that would be one of the main points where people can be squeezed more for their productivity because there used to be a limiting factor before we had electricity and light, which was you need daylight to do a lot of your work. If it's just pitch black, you can't farm crops and things quite as well. You can't hunt as well. We're 
daytime creatures is where we thrive. But Industrial Revolution comes up and we've suddenly got coffee and lights. So you could make people work for obscene hours of time. So it raises a bunch of questions about how much should people work and how should the profits and things be distributed. Absolutely. And uh, this is where uh, Marx get in, gets into the conversation and talks about how we could look at the way the economy works and why we should be critical about some things. And to some degree, he looks at how we could look at things differently, but not so much. Um, he wasn't like most of his work is a pure analysis of what's happening or what was happening at this time. Um, I want to give a quick response to Eurocopy. Um, yeah, of course, this is my opinion. I hope I stated that, that I don't know what will happen. And it's possible that we, we all run out of things to do, but then we're kind of at a point where there's I think if everyone's out of a job and no one makes money anymore. There's no need to produce things anymore because there's no one that can afford those things unless we're coming up with a, a different um, structure, like everyone just gets money to afford things. But that's kind of way down the line of what we'll be talking about today. Um, but you're right that it's getting increasingly difficult to for people with lower education to um, have the same kind of flexibility to find a job in another area. So I'm not saying it's getting easier for laborers or it's um, the same as it used to be. I think it definitely got more difficult. Right, so automation is affecting different uh, demographics of people uh, Basically, some people had their jobs completely replaced already, and we're watching that process happen of some people's jobs get replaced by automation, and then other people have a job that couldn't exist before automation. So there's basically the passing away of certain jobs that used to be human only, and then now they get automated, and then there's the creation of, okay, we need people to improve these systems, so they need to have technical expertise. But yeah, education is definitely a factor in being successful whenever there's a, a structural change in however people are working. You can assess things too, like how much should people work? How many hours per day? How many hours per week? What is healthy? What is required? And then there's the question too of what is a fair compensation for a person's labor of different types? That's an assessment that people never stop talking about because it's really important if you don't get paid fairly for your work you can't afford to survive and pay your bills and that's the the big shift from hunter-gatherer society to more modern life which is you have a job which is neither hunting nor gathering you don't need to on a daily-ish basis try to find the food that you need to eat you do stuff that's oftentimes very different from that and it's valuable to someone else. So they compensate you with money and then eventually you can buy food and pay your bills with that money. But it's a, an interesting question of how much someone's work is worth for what they're doing. What do they deserve to be paid? And I think there's a somewhat of a duality in there because usually we assume that our work should be valued more than we're getting right now. So I want to get a little more pay because I'm doing a good job. On At the same time, we're thinking we should pay less for the coffee we buy at the supermarket mm -hmm. because we want to get more value out of the money that we're getting. And in order to get more value out of it, we want things to be cheaper. But then you have the other side of this where there's someone growing the coffee and they probably want to get more pay as well. So it's like, it really is a social issue where we need to consider um, what 
what's the value of work um, that is separated from its product because its product might not necessarily be a, a reflection of the, the human labor put into it. And that's exactly um, what March was arguing for, that we should basically only look at the labor putting into a commodity in order to determine its social value. Mm. And this isn't to say that Marx was arguing that we shouldn't look at uh, things like what kind of materia goes in there and that materia has value as well, or that we need uh, machines to do stuff. It's just a simplistic view to illustrate a point more so than any in-depth analysis of how we come to value things. Mm. So I looked up some nice pictures of things that we can kind of try to get a sense of what is valuable and why and how much value there is in something. So we're starting off with a nice apple. I'll post it in Discord. Discord, exactly. It's an apple. That's a nice apple. Is it TOS to show this? It's the inside of the apple. It's actually three and a half apples. So how much would you value one of those apples? Mm, I haven't quite memorized the value of the apples that I order, but I usually order, if I'm getting groceries or something, eight. And that'll last me a week or two, and I can put them in the fridge, and they'll last a pretty long time. I would say for the health value of the apple, you could say two apples could be a dollar. That seems pretty fair to me, US dollar. Uh, one apple is exactly uh, as valuable as one apple. That's a really good comparison. Oh, you're comparing um, apples I, to apples now. <laughs> yeah. So what if I were to tell you that the specific apple you're looking at, or the bunch of apples, they are called, uh, what was it? Got it here somewhere. It's a Sakai Ishi apple from Japan. They are up to two pounds in weight and will cost 21 bucks per apple. Two pound apple costs $21? Yeah. Yep. Why? It's huge and it's special. Like it, it takes a lot of care to to produce this apple. Ooh, it's gourmet. Uh, I get that. Yeah. So yeah, we're comparing apples to apples, but apples aren't the same as apples. There are different kinds of apple, yeah, with different values associated with them. So in this sense, this apple is about um, as much value as 20 other apples. One apple equals 20 apples, depending on the type of apple. What's your favorite kind of apple? It's Fuji for me. Um, my favorite kind of apple is a rare old kind that is only uh, specific to a region in Switzerland, it's called uh, uh, Rose of Bern. 
Rose of what? Uh, Bern. It's the capital of Switzerland, and it's like from that region. How do you spell Berg? Bern. B E R N. Berm. Got him. Uh, N, not N. Rose of M or N? <laughs> Wait, I'll. Uh, N. Rose of Burn. No. Oh, there's a silent E at the end. Ah, oh, that's if you spell it uh, the French way. Burn. Oh, I see this. That looks like a tomato. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. This is a hecking tomato. Look at this chat. Tell me this. these are not tomatoes. This is absolutely tomatoes. This looks like an apple. Huh. Somewhere between an apple and a tomato. There's the Rose of Bern. Ah, there's also a tomato kind that has the same name. Oh, I see. But it would be the apple. Oh, yeah. so these, these actually are tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> He's trolling us. We just debated the meaning of money and hour debating what really is an apple. <laughs> nice, that looks cool. But those are rare, and if they're rare, they're probably more expensive. That is the case. <laughs> but yeah, I thought we should start with an apple just to show you that even comparing apples with apples doesn't make things any easier. Right. Then you just get into the debate of what is an apple. Yeah. So we're gonna go even a bit more abstract on what Wally is with a lovely painting of orange stripes on a black violet background. I think that's a fair way to describe it. Hmm. this the orange seems to be blocking a view of something that's how yeah. it feels so you can perceive the depth of it which is pretty so the orange is in the front relative to the viewer and then you've got the different shades of blue behind which could be a sky it could be an ocean could be a pool of water or something. Yeah, I, I was looking at abstract art, trying to find something that I found aesthetically pleasing, and that has some value to it, even though it may not appear that way. So how much do you think is this painting worth? 87,000 US dollars. And chat, you're also welcome to make up your suggestions. Guess the value of this painting. Is it, is it $10? Is it a hundred? Is it 10,000? Is it a million? Uh, I think it's a Richter. It says Gerard Richter in the link. Five hundred dollars. <laughs> one dollar. Come on, a one dollar painting is not going to be on the internet. Maybe. The canvas is worth a dollar at this point due to inflation. The spray paint costs five dollars, so it's ten. Oh, utilitarian. <laughs> That's not giving any value to the skill of the artist. But maybe you don't like the look of this. Blue and orange are color complements of each other. It's also the Denver Broncos colors. I like blue and orange together. Yeah, so Stone Coat is onto something. It is a painting with a big name attached, but it's not a million of dollars. It's 170,000, or this is what was paid for at the auction it was last sold. Mm. 
So 170K. So we're going to contrast that to a different type of artwork, which was shown at a Swiss museum. I'm not sure if it was shown at a Swiss art gallery first. It's been shown in New York as well. Uh, we're going to get into that one. I think it was first at a Swiss show. So next piece of art. How much would you value this? Is this TOS? <laughs> uh, a little, I guess. This is... How much is this worth, like, the banana or, like... It's the white the, thing the, a canvas? It's just a wall. It's not a canvas. So it's just a banana duct taped to a wall. At an art gallery. So... Were there some unruly youths who taped a banana to the wall? <laughs> you bid one dollar. Bidding starts at one dollar. Fuzzy cord, I have one dollar. Chat, do we have more than one dollar? We have the banana against the wall by duct tape. Was this a brilliant artist who's saying something about society these days? Or was it some vandal who thought it would be funny to tape a banana to the wall and see how many people would look at it? So the work is called The Comedian. Huh. Yeah, the artist is being a comedian with this. It's also, I don't know if the shape is meant to mean anything. The duct tape is kind of at 45 degree angle. The banana is at a particular angle. They could have stuck the banana to wall at a different angle and formation relative to the tape. So a person could take pause and say, why did you do this? <laughs> and then why did you do this this way? Why is the banana well, not on the wall a different way? I do think for it being a banana duct taped to a wall, it does look aesthetically pleasing. So I think they were doing a good job, job at presenting what it is. Mm. So Hawkfeather Hawk is onto something. Um, this art installation was valued at 130,000. So about two thirds of the price of the Richard painting. Chat, gonna wrap up the stream. I'm gonna go get some bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. You said 130,000? Yeah. Yeah. Get rich quick scheme. There's always money in the banana stand. Wow. So when this art was moved to New York, and I sure hope they used a different banana for it because it's not like lasting art. So I think they just used new duct tape and the new banana for the installation in, in New York. A performance artist came up to it and ate the banana, the $130,000 banana, which is art in itself performance art of uh, eating a banana yes was it a particularly good banana was there any note of this was it a decent banana it could have been a below par banana so he oh here it is he talks about it afterwards and it's interesting to hear his view on what it feels like to eat such an expensive banana I would think too much about like how many months of rent did I just spend to eat this banana? Is the human worth 130k more now? That's the crazy thing is this just turns into excrement. The same as any other banana. Probably, unless it's a magical banana. Oh, it's a video of him eating it. Let's go. Wow. He's a performance artist. Is there a video of him eating this? Oh, here we go. Art performance. Art performance. Hungry artist. Yep. 
What? He's not even jazzing it up. Mauricio, but his art performance can't react in the gallery. So it's a big deal because it's so expensive, I guess. But there's no confetti, he's not doing magic tricks. He's just standing there eating the banana. 150,000? <laughs> That's been good. <laughs> what the hell? Yes, let's find another banana because you do not eat the banana, it's a banana. I ate another one last night. Okay. Man. That is a flex. Can just spend that much money on a banana. We got bills to pay, fam. <laughs> so what we're already seeing it gets a bit tricky with how we value things and why we're willing to. Some people are willing to pay a hundred and thirty thousand dollars for a banana, and other people just eat a banana off wall. as a flex because you can. So yeah. I wouldn't really say that he got physical value in addition to any normal banana. He could get psychological value from the banana in that he feels like a badass because he can just say, I don't give a fuck. I'll just spend 150 grand or 120, whatever it costs to eat this banana right now. And everyone in the room will gasp and will also make the news, which he did. So if you're seeking attention, he did get some ROI there to the common person who works and pays rent and stuff who can't eat $120,000 bananas. That seems excessive and almost like silly and hedonistic, but yeah, he probably got something out of it in addition to a regular banana. Well, I also think it, it's a beautiful artistic work in a sense of really showing the um the difficulties we're having with um figuring out value and what it is and how we should look at it so it's it is a uh, transformative piece in that sense where it's we establish value at first and then show that it's for the most part it's just a nutritional value that is valuable within a banana whether it's that uh, duct tape to a wall or it's just laying around a, at a supermarket. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at least it didn't go to waste. Like otherwise they would have just thrown it away afterwards. True, but just throwing it away would have been less wasteful. Probably. I don't know. You can get kind of philosophical and say, well, he just, he, by eating this banana, was able to not only make the news, but it ra raised a bunch of philosophical questions which were discussed on the internet for some time. It did. It definitely did. So, next I was looking up a nice house somewhat near where I live. This is a place you can buy in Switzerland. Beautiful old house. Um, I th think you can see the value underneath if you just open it up as is. So maybe you want to just focus in on the, the pictures. Yeah. So we've got, can we full screen this? Oh, nice. Beautiful village there. Very green grass, nice bits of trees, mountains. Gorgeous. Very high quality wood. Super uniform, very spacious rooms. Nice clean windows. Everything looks brand new. This is like artisan wood. All right, we need to craft this and have zero mistakes. Okay. 
This looks very expensive. It's a lovely home. It's not positioned in the most attractive region in Switzerland. So this is a bit more rural, a bit more um, off the main roads, I think you'd say. But it's a really lovely house. So how much would you value having a place on your own in the middle of nowhere? Place of your... Does it have good internet? Yes. That's pretty good. I think like a standard rate for people getting a home in the US, like you could say hundreds of thousands of dollars to low millions. That's kind of your normal range. To live on your own in the woods. If you had a pretty modest sized place, like this is a big house, it looks like. You've got two story, a bunch of rooms, very spacious rooms. Hmm. 100K, 200K? If it's a modest place, fiber internet. This says well, it's, it's. Sorry, go on. This is CHF, 1.6 yeah. million. Yep. That's so 1.73 USD million. Yeah. So rather expensive. I would say most people can't afford this house. Well, you'd not be paying the full price. You'd be um, loaning it. Like usually in Switzerland, you need twenty percent of the um, of the buying price for you to get a good rate on a uh, loan on the house. Mm hmm. Uh, it's still a lot of money. Correct. So I think a house is, is a less abstract example than a banana duct tape to a wall to kind of consider, all right, why is a house valuable? And what what is the labor value, for mm. example, put into a house? What is the value of the ground it's built on? And also, what is the value for a family getting it? Right. So, so the I, labor value of the house is way higher than the banana to the wall. As And it was easier, too, for me to list off the different reasons why the house is more valuable, like the high quality ingredients in it, like the wood is really good in this house. And it's very well constructed. It looks sturdy and symmetrical and perfect and polished. The banana to the wall, that looks super cheap. It's art, yes, but the value is less tangible and easy to list out. So, but you could argue that this is only worth roughly 15 bananas duct taped to a wall. Would you rather have, ladies and gentlemen, this house <laughs> or, drum roll, behind door number two, we have... 15 bananas taped to a wall. This man here, he decided this 15th of that house was worth it. I could not eat this banana 15 times and buy a house. <laughs> or I could make the news. I think I would take the house. Yeah, I think I will go with the house too. <laughs> Depends on how hungry I am at the moment, I guess. I mean, you could sell the house and get such a mountain of normal bananas. <laughs> it would be like a hill that would be part of the mountain range. Yeah, but that would take extra steps. Like just getting the banana right now, <laughs> so much easier. Not worth it. The body can survive for a decent bit of time. For the health that this gentleman is in, he would survive to make it to the grocery store, even if it took him three days. As long as he got some water. I think he could survive three days. But maybe it's like a psychology thing where he was that hungry. That they just had no concessions in this uh, art gallery. But they did have the banana on display. And he said, this is what I can eat here. <laughs> Do 
Is there a level of starvation that would make it worth it? Technically, yes. If you are one banana away from dying, <laughs> it's worth it. Maybe you could say if you're like two bananas away from dying, or maybe even five, just because you don't want to risk it and you know you're kind of close to dying. Yeah, you would go for the banana if you have the money. How you can be in such a situation with that much money on your person, I think that's a bigger issue. <laughs> All right, so now we're getting to an interesting uh, point in the value of the house. How many rooms are in that house and could you rent them out to make money from the house? It says 5.5 .5 rooms, so yes, you could. I would guess it would be fairly easy to rent out like two rooms, maybe even three. Or you could just be the kind of person who you just buy this because you think it's valuable and then you use it as a Airbnb or something. You could use this for different stuff as well. So the rooms are very well constructed. I would guess the sound isolation is decent, decent to good. And the view of this location is really good too. So tourists who want to visit here, you've got a natural reason for people to go to this house because they want to go to this town. They want to hike around. They want to enjoy Switzerland. Exactly. So there's value in this house in a sense of it being a commodity you could then again trade and make money off. Mm -hmm. So you you can see it as a, an initial investment. So you put in a lot of money, but you assume and hope that it will make you more money in return than what you put in. Mm -hmm. So the question that would arise there is, where does that extra value come from? Like we're, we're buying X for amount Y and we're selling X for uh, Y plus another amount. So it, at some point in the exchange, it got more valuable without having anything changed in it. Right, you have to do all the construction costs, like you establish a bare minimum value for the house of what it costs to build it just in raw materials. And then you factor in the time and then the skill level or whatever the pay rate uh, was of all the people who built it and had a hand in that. And then you also need the cost of transporting all the materials there to that location, whatever that cost. All of these things would be like bare minimum operating costs to make the house a reality. And then on top of that, you would have like the presentation of it, the how you paint it. You have to pay all the painters. And then the location is another point of value. If it's in a really good spot where it has good access to what people want, it's going to be way more expensive. If it's in a terrible area with like a ton of noise and it's really gross and the air is bad, that's going to be a worse location. So that would drive the price down or keep it closer to the bare minimum cost. Yeah. Location, location, location is what they say for real estate. Exactly. So this is uh, in an area where it's like, this is fairly cheap for a house this size in Switzerland because it's not as good of a location. What makes this location not as good? It's close to other houses. Uh, all the houses in Switzerland are close to other houses. Oh. Like it's the, um, I don't know what the word is, um, where you have um, population density is really high in Switzerland because mm -hmm. there's like two thirds of Switzerland are Alps. So there's kind of, we try to use all the space in between the mountains. Mm -hmm. So there's, like there's still a lot of green and it's not like there's houses everywhere, but the, the population really is dense. Yeah, you um, have 8.5 million people distributed across 15,000 square miles. So like 20k kilometers or something. Yeah. But also the currency value in Switzerland is high relative to other countries, I would say very high. Yeah. Uh, 
It's heavier I than the it, dollar. It's difficult to compare this to um, a similar looking house in another area and a or a bigger, smaller house if you're looking at a place where it's really high demand. So there's this kind of supply and demand value of the house where if, if you're building in an area where everyone wants to, to, to live, you can sell something that's worth a lot less than all those costs we established before, like labor put into it or material values. But since it's the demand is high, you can sell it for a much higher price. Yep. The more people want it, the higher they have to bid against each other. And a lot of times people are heavily driven to be in an area just due to proximity to work. They want to live close to where they need to go to work. Yeah, that's true. And this makes sense. But I also think this has somewhat changed with the pandemic now that working from home seems a lot more common i think people are a bit less um bound to be super close to their work mm -hmm. very true a lot of people are saying the sentiment let us work from home we don't need to go into the office we've been able to carry on like this There's a pretty strong like work culture, office culture. It varies based on country, but they want to see you physically present there in the office, even if you don't necessarily have an actionable item that you need to crank out and it's going to take a certain amount of time. It's like you clock in, you clock out, and you're always there walking around doing stuff. Uh, with the pandemic and people being quarantined and stuff, it really tested how much do you physically absolutely need to be in an office to do stuff. And for many jobs, you might not even need to go there at all. So certain jobs are becoming remote because we have internet access. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other thing is mainly about control, where you want to see your workers coming in every day and you want to have control over whether or not they spend their time, quote unquote, working. Mm -hmm. Which, having worked in an office for quite a while, you you can be just as unproductive, if not, more, if not more unproductive when you're at work than when you're working from home. Mm. It's, there's not a, a, in my opinion, there's no good correlation between where you're spending your time from and how much work you're actually doing. In my experience, I found it easier to work from home because I can use my non-productive time um, more wisely like i can make more out of the time i'm not working mm -hmm. and therefore i'm more productive while at work yeah you have more pressure to actively make changes in your environment when you're working than when you're spending leisure time with leisure time a lot of it is about rest and maintaining your body making sure that you're healthy and taking care of and all that and that needs to happen for you to be able to work. But uh, with creative things, you don't always have an immediate pressure. You can kind of take your time and think about whatever. But if you're doing work that is a task for someone else, you usually need to be focused or an energy on something. Oh, there's one more picture I we can look at to evaluate and this is i guess the picture is not um tos but guessing the value of this will be a bit problematic and you'll see why banana tape to a wall house no. So oh, this is the first thing that came up on Google image search when I searched person. What is the value of a person? To do what? Their total value? Of all the things they can do? 
we don't usually ascribe value to people. We have something called net worth, which is the size of all your businesses and assets and stuff. But you can have different kinds of value, informational value. People don't get paid equal amounts of money for all the different kinds of work. But you could make the argument that certain people provide a ton of value, even if they don't get a bunch of revenue for it. It's also a little bit offensive to try to put numbers to people. I think that's unfair and it's always going to be to an extent inaccurate because the lives that people lead are super complicated and it doesn't really make sense to try to do that. Put money to a human being. I think it, it gets really difficult when we're trying to establish the value of a person and uh, there's lots of ways to go about it. On the other hand, socially, we uh, attribute value to people in many different ways, especially when we're looking at, all right, your time is this valuable because you're good at this job or you're just getting minimum wage for whatever your skill is. So it's the value of a person socially these days is heavily dependent on a skill set. Mm. So there's no good way of saying, all right, a average person is worth X, but you could look at it statistically and say, all right, an average person is worth X. So we're, we're thinking of it as being morally problematic to value a human being when we're just judging it. But at the same time, we're valuing a human being by the amount we're paying them for their labor. So it's, it's not that out there of a concept to trying to establish what a human uh, is actually worth in yeah, I think social context. The context there too is what is a person's time worth? Because it's not the person as a complete entity that you're trying to make a transaction for. It is the effort they're exerting with the skill that they're leveraging for that amount of time. And that's what you should pay them. Yeah. And then we could look at a um, average time a person spends on the labor market, say 50 years, and uh, they work 80% of the time making this amount of money. So we could think of a person, and I'm not saying it's necessarily a good idea, as be worth as much as they will be able to produce throughout their lifetime. Mm. And then we can kind of um, turn that around and look what they are worth at a specific time. And this kind of all goes into how we're thinking about money in the sense of what are we worth ourselves? And what are we willing to do to make money to, to make a living and how this should, like how much having to work should affect us in order to make a living. And this was the main argument that Marx was um, constructing is, are we not worth more than we're getting for our labor? I think most people would argue we're not getting what we're worth, where there's an incentive for the, the person who's paying people to pay them as little as possible so that they have more resource to devote to their causes. So the business is self-interested and wants to run well and run with a good profit. So any person who's under that is going to have a, a pressure driving it down what drives it up. I think that's a, an issue that we've been having with a lot of what people earn versus what education costs and what cost of living is in the United States and I think a lot of other countries as well. Where compared to 30 years ago, it's a lot more expensive to pay rent for working a minimum wage job. Relative minimum wage in the past was better for being able to live off of than what it is presently, which is why a lot of states have been voting to do a 
15 US dollar minimum wage, which isn't really enough to pay rent in a lot of locations, but it's an improvement. I think growing up it was maybe seven, eight dollars in Texas, which would have had a, a lower minimum wage. I remember earning close to that as a lifeguard. I think I earn more because you have to be certified as a lifeguard. You have to take certain classes and they are technically kind of hard. You have to be able to swim down to the bottom of a 10 foot, three meter ish pool, pick up a brick, swim to the top, and then hold the brick above water as you swim to the edge. So that would be a step above what a lot of minimum wage jobs would have. And you're also dealing with jumping in to save people who would be drowning, which is a pretty intense thing. But the average workflow of a lifeguard is sitting there and yelling at people, walk. That's it, most of the time. So it's not a super intense thing like being an emergency room worker where you're getting patients cranked in consistently. It's relatively more chill. But yeah, we don't pay people a ton of money for their stuff. I don't think anyone is saying like, yeah, I get paid way too much for what I do. Maybe some people. Man, uh, the other question would be, even if they think they get paid way too much, would they actually work for less? Or would they still demand more given the chance? You can... Uh, there, there you can sort of th see that with wealthy people of how philanthropic are they? Are they investing in other things that are not their own self-interest and their own estate? They can donate stuff, they can give freely and that kind of thing. But the way that it works for money is the people who are super, super rich, there seems to be a almost gravitational aspect of money where money attracts money. So if you have a ton of money, you can roll a ton of investments and that usually means you're going to be getting more wealthy. Yeah, why would you choose less money? I think the with people with higher education, people that are working jobs that are paid well, from my experience, they're usually not as much uh, concerned with how much they're making, but with how much time they're spending at work. So mm -hmm. a lot of people I know prefer to uh, work a bit less, but also get a bit less. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we're not limited by how much money we need to make, but rather by how much time we want to spend, um, worrying about money. Mm, Mike's not picking me up, right? It sounds uh, like you're a little bit further away in this conversation. Uh -huh always moving around a bit and if i have like the microphone right in front of me i'm not seeing chat anymore so it's a bit difficult i'm trying my best though so i think it should be better now it does sound better chat would you agree chat says way better yeah it sounds awesome. like you got closer to it i have to hassle agent smith about that too <laughs> mics are very sensitive that was actually a huge improvement that up a tree zelda helped me with i had a blue yeti as my mainstream mic for a really long time. And the sound quality dramatically improved just by me putting it next to me on the desk after he was recommending making it closer. I think I initially had it behind my monitor, but my monitor was in front of me and it was right there. Whereas before it was kind of off to the side. It was in the room, so it was gonna capture me, but it was not the best. Location relative to mic is difficult. And some say audio optimization is more difficult than video. It definitely is. It it's is. a lot easier to get good video footage than it is to get good audio. And it's mostly due that we have a much, much better technology to capture um, visual images where a camera can look at what you're looking through the, um, the, the sensor of the camera and interpreting it at, all right, this is so far away. This needs this amount of light to look good. This is 
a moving object so we want to kind of track that so the camera does a lot more interpretation of what's happening than a mic ever could so a mic just hears noise or no noise and i think good microphones somewhat have a sense of the direction um, a noise is coming from but it's not able to interpret all right this is good noise and this is bad noise mm -hmm. It's interesting that audio, I think, intuitively seems less information intensive than video. But I think a lot of it has to do with the recording and the perception of it has more variation. We have Fuzzy Cord in the chat. He's uh, an audio oriented guy, more so than your average bear. Did our first ever music theory lesson. And we have plans for more. It was really fun and interactive. We actually did some uh, live metal creation. I asked some philosophical questions actually of like, what makes black metal sound like black metal? And we talked about distortion and how you're basically cutting into the sound waves and making them more jagged when before they were more smooth. And if you do that in certain ways, it sounds cool to people. So music is beautiful and interesting. It has a lot of overlap with mathematics. And I would say philosophy also has that same uh, structure of you need to have a consistent chain of logic where the statements agree with each other if you want to build toward a larger idea. It uh, makes it a lot easier. Then again, you can also go the approach of just throwing something out there. And um, it's basically compared to um, throwing something uh, onto a wall and see if it sticks. So that's also a valid philosophical approach. Mm -hmm. Throw uh, up an idea until someone else can bat it down. <laughs> Just make some wild claim and be like, yeah. you can't prove me wrong. And they're like, well, oh, crap, now I have to do a ton of work. <laughs> and it's actually pretty hard to disprove what you're saying. But I think that it's wrong. <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, if you're not willing to just throw something at a wall, you could also duct tape it to it. Mm -hmm. So that, that way you know it will stick. Yeah, sometimes when you duct tape something to the wall, the value of it just shoots up like $100,000 right away. So be aware of that. Fruits and vegetables, we'll try that. There's the Rosa Burn which some say is a tomato, other people say it's an apple, duct tape that to a wall, well, that's going to be worth a lot. <laughs> so, um, I want to know, are there any German speakers in chat? Because I have this beautiful uh, quote here I want to read, but if there's no one understanding German, we can just look at it in English. But it kind of loses its um, its grip in English, so it's one ginormous sentence in in German, and the English version splits it up into four sentences. So it's it's not as fun, in my opinion. Are we getting the German or the English? Um, we have two two <clears throat> one and a half German speakers in the chat. No, we have we have. I have both versions either way. And yeah, if you even if you speak German, you will likely not understand it. So it took me roughly one and a half hours to understand this sentence because it's super dense. It's it basically breaks down the whole economic system into a single principle and makes fun of it in some sense like it makes not fun of the principle it makes fun of the the whole sentence which is a nice thing to do when you're writing but it's also in in my view a good case of why people do not bother reading Marx because it's just so, way too dense 
So Marx is dense and verbose writing style. We're getting a piece from him? Yeah. So I'm going to read the German version first, and then we can look at the English a bit more in depth. I, for some reason, I had to read this sentence so many times when I was trying to understand it that I um, had it recognized, but that's been a while, so I'll have to read it this time. So, es bedarf vollständig entwickelter Warenproduktion, bevor aus der Erfahrung selbst die wissenschaftliche Einsicht herauswächst, dass die unabhängig voneinander betriebenen, aber als naturwüchsige Glieder der gesellschaftlichen Teilung der Arbeit allseitig voneinander abhängigen Privatarbeiten fortwährend auf ihr gesellschaftlich proportionelles Maß reduziert werden, weil sich in den zufälligen und stets schwankenden Austauschverhältnissen ihrer Produkte, die zu deren Produktion gesellschaftlich notwendig die Arbeitszeit als Regeln des Naturgesetzes gewaltsam durchsetzt, wie etwa das Gesetz der Schwere, wenn einem das Haus über dem Kopf zusammenpurzelt. That's one sentence. That's one sentence. So you can breathe now at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, you would need to be an Olympic swimmer to do that one. <laughs> now, I guess it sounded a lot more Swiss German than I intended. I was trying to read it in German, but it's it's difficult for us Swiss speaking people. <laughs> you also speak French oh. though, right? And English? Uh, a little bit. Hmm. Like my French is really not up to par. I understand a lot, but speaking it is... I have to think too much in order to structure sentences. Can you read that to us in American now? <laughs> <laughs> I can try. So. It requires a fully developed production of commodities before, from accumulation experience alone, the scientific uh, conviction springs up that the different kinds of private labor, which are, well, no, it's too big. Um, that all the different kinds of labor which are carried on independently of each other and yet as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportion in which society requires them. And why? Because in the midst of all the accidental and ever fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary for their production forcibly asserts itself like an overriding law of nature. The law of gravity fast asserts itself when a house falls about our ears. He's very verbose. Who else did <laughs> we talk about who was Kant? Yes. He's very deep in verbose. They would get along, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they could certainly talk to each other for a long time. They definitely could. Yeah, so this is what I kind of um, was hinting at when we talked about Kant, that Kant established this um type of language that is so it's almost robotic yeah robotic confusing it's it's so um precise that we're using the specific term we're we're not shorten it down to to make it easy to understand we're lengthening it in order to make it as precise as possible mm -hmm. and this kind of language established itself as being the way philosophy is supposed to be done. And I think this is what's been hurting philosophy for ever since. Like philosophy is not something people want to associate themselves with. It's not something people would um, read voluntarily. It got so impossible to understand. Um, that yeah it's just it becomes nonsense in a way mm. so there's people saying they want to be able to read it which I, is a fair claim so here's the link and if you do control f in order to find this sentence, you'll be right where I was reading. It requires a fully developed... Can we 
zoom this? Enhance. De enhance. <laughs> So he starts out his argument by saying we, we need uh, fully developed production, meaning that we we need to be at the end point of how effectively we can produce something. Which is something that we haven't reached yet. So maybe the point is that we will never reach this. Uh, stage where we know, all right, this is something that we can not do any more efficient. <laughs> I assume this used to be a bit different in his times. There's was less of this sense, all right, we can do everything faster, bigger, stronger than there is nowadays, where we just talked about the word words biggest car which is kind of dumb according to you yeah it's not practical at all it's like that guy eating that banana <laughs> you're just doing it as a flex which humans want to do that's a, a thing people do flex someone in the chat pointed out people maybe consciously or subconsciously they broadcast their wealth to people by the quality of the clothes they wear and the car that they drive and the place that they live like you can kind of tell there aren't that many people who as you earn more and more and more, you just stay in a very low income area. You usually leave and keep upsizing as you go. Yeah, most people show the money they have. Not everyone does though. You'll occasionally get the really low key rich person. He'd be like, wait, you have a ton of money? Yeah. Um, thank you for copying that into chat, Fatih Card. Um, yeah, so we need to look at how something is produced and it being produced at its most effective in order to be able to look at the different kinds and types of labor uh, that are being put into it and looking at how we're dividing up labor in order to, to, to see the the proportion of that in order to see, and this is Marx's argument, um, as for the, um, what is it called? The, the labor theory of value that we, we only need to look at how much time an average worker would need to put into a commodity in order to establish its value. Mm. How can people tell what stuff is worth? Yeah. And this is not to, to a means to determine how much uh, an apple is worth. This is more so a mean to determine how much labor is worth. So mm -hmm. he was concerned about the, the labor side of things, not the, the value of commodities. But there is, they're tied together. And this is what he establishes over many, many more sentences. Most of them not as long as this one, but it's it's really confusing. But it's the the, the logic he establishes, he establishes, and the way he really breaks it down and making it super easy to to understand if you're willing to to put your mind to it, it is kind of the legacy of his work. He, he really um, looked at these different concepts like labor, um, money, value, and put them into proportion to each other and, and showing you, all right, this is how we derive at uh, value of labor based on value of commodity. This is how we um, can look at money as value by itself uh, because it has this exchange value to it and the point he's always driving at is what i've been asking you with the the house we looked at where there is inherent value in the house like it's it's obvious to see that a house is valuable but there is um 
additional value to the house as soon as you buy it as a commodity, but then being able to sell it again for a period of time to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. And this is what Marx called excess value, um, or one example of excess value. Another example of excess value is um, producing computer parts and I need um, X amount of um, materials, X amount of infrastructure to build it. And I have uh, X amount of workers that produce it. And those workers are able to produce say 200 parts an hour. And I'm paying each of the worker um, $10 an hour. So the value of the 200 parts would be $10 times 200 divided by 200, which brings us back to, to the $10 plus the, the value of the infrastructure and the material mm. as a really basic example. And now the parts are being sold for $50. So meaning for a worker, I produce something within an hour that would take me five hours of work to buy for myself. So there is excess value being produced by my labor, which is going somewhere. And in Marx's argument, it's going to the capitalist, the ones owning the means of production, uh, in order to pay for materials, pay for um, infrastructure, but also in terms of profit. You want to make a profit from your investment. You want to employ workers that do work for you. Um, you tend to not pay them more than they're worth. You more or less try to pay them as little as possible mm -hmm. or as little as socially accepted. Basically, you're trying to, to give them just enough money so you have enough people working for you. And then there's somewhat of a fluctuation in that. Um, so he's basically saying that we're what we're producing is valued more than what we're producing it for. So there's this distinction between the, the value that we're putting into something to the value we're trying to get out of something. And all that value is being extracted by those who already own things. And it's taken away from the people that... Um, That are putting in the work basically mm -hmm. and this was his critique of the economy especially during the industrial revolution where it's really you kind of got alienated from your own work was his argument you're you do something you get p paid for it but you're not you don't own your work anymore right it now belongs to the boss yeah so to he's very verbose and technical and thorough which i think there's a bit of a disconnect between uh i would say as an american we get a lot of propaganda that russia bad communism bad just like general thing because they were a rival for the cold war and just a lot of ideological differences but it was kind of the communism versus capitalism and there's the sentiment that communism must be kind of sexy or dangerous in some way kind of a thing. But we're talking value theory here, which is pretty, it's a dry technical question of what is a person's worth for their effort and time? And why do these systems tend to favor the businesses and the bosses getting more of the excess money where the people tend to fall behind as things develop? So they're important questions to ask for sure. Not the most fun or flamboyant writing style. 
Because I played that. But it gets the job done. It made a really big mark on the philosophical landscape too. So that's a pretty huge point of value. And that's, I think, a key thing about philosophy in general or just going out into any field. If you make a substantial enough set of questions, a lot of people can work from that and get to better questions. And isn't that the journey of philosophy where the old philosophers ask really good questions and then the next generation they ask the next questions but you don't really just check the boxes off of okay we're gonna answer all these old ones and just figure everything out so as expected we're, we're um going down the road of talking about communism and its social evaluation these days which is quite separate from Marx's writing, in my opinion. He had a big influence, and I, I don't want to make a value judgment of that he did a good job of um, influencing people um, in that direction or not. It's more so that we're attributing communism as it's been established in the UDSSR as well as in China and evaluating Marx's work based on that outcome, which he was not anticipating. He was not, um, not it, even considering it. It he wasn't was his thinking, master plan. He wasn't planning to like convert multiple governments to do his method and way and build his legacy. Uh, well, he kind of was, but he was expecting it to happen in more developed nations. So uh -huh. he was thinking this is something that should happen in Germany or France at the time, or the UK. So mm. he was not expecting communism to happen in Russia or in China. Mm. But this is also like, it's a lot about based on the conclusions he took out of his analysis, which are quite wrong at some points. But um, I want to do that on a kind of different, uh, on a separate lecture on Marx, where we're looking at what his conclusions were, what influence they had, and how they might have been not um, put into practice as much as we um, would think they should be. Man, how is that going to put that stuff into practice? There's so much of it. I was just flipping through the pages whenever you linked the thing. I was like, damn, all of this? This is really hard to put on a propaganda poster. Jeez Louise. We've got pages and pages. He writes in extremely long sentences. And every time you get to end a sentence, it's kind of like a breath where you can just process that prior idea. But he's got so many pieces, lots and lots of commas. Yeah. This is something you can do in German, which is... Not makes it any easier on the reader, but it it's, can be somewhat of a fun style to, to, to put everything into one sentence. This is one sentence. We've got four lines. One, two, three, four, five, six commas of a sentence. And this is just a random sample here. Yeah, so certain people would have, I guess, taken things from this and then they spin it that way. But what was he trying to set out to do? He wanted these to be applied in... France in the UK. That was his vision. Um, he saw that there is this disconnect between um, people doing the labor and people owning the means of production. This surplus value that is being uh, distributed um, wrongly. He saw that people doing all the work in factories at the time, they were living miserable lives. Mm. While the people owning the means of production 
were living it up as much as they do nowadays. Mm -hmm. And he thought this going forward will not work, which is a really good analysis of the status quo at his time because it is it was not something that could go on as it was but the way he imagined it it would be an uprise of the the lower class in order to overthrow the um the upper class to then basically um make a classless system but this turned out to be not the case. So the way Marx was imagining it is that we're, we're realizing, all right, something's going wrong here. We're, we're getting pushed into this system where there's winners and losers. And since there's too many losers and too few winners, the losers will rebel at some point and they want to make a system of where there is no winners and losers anymore. Right. The question that people often ask with a capitalist perspective is, where's the value in putting in work then? Like putting in more effort. If people are paid very highly, there's less of a pressure for you to try to overperform to improve your station because the people get so much money. Yeah, and I think that's a, a very valued uh, criticism of the uh, the ideal that anyone should get the same. I think w one of the the initial problems where Marx already hinted at this was he was always talking about um, laboring hours of a um, not sure an average worker. And so this is on his, uh, one of the part of his books is on the time one takes to produce something. So let's imagine we have two workers and one of them is rather lazy. The other one is super productive. So the productive guy can make um, three things in an hour and the lazy guy makes half a thing in an hour. So if we're just looking at the labor time put into that, the value of the the lazy worker of one piece of what they're doing would be six times as high because it took them a bunch more work. Mm -hmm. But the other guy is putting out six of these things in the same time. So he could sell six of those. So we're like looking at the labor time itself is not as helpful as we would hope it to be. Right, because people are working at different speeds. So for the people uh, in any given field, say your job is to stick bananas to walls. If you can stick 10 bananas to a wall and someone else can only stick two to the wall and you both worked for an hour, you should get paid more. Five yeah. times as much of it's direct. Yeah. Imagine how much money you could make by being able to stick 10 bananas to a wall in an hour. <laughs> That's a lot of money. I'm talking like a nice yacht and everyone's invited and we're going to have a party. Yeah, so this is, I think, where a lot of people... I wouldn't necessarily say get confused, but are being told wrong things about Marx's connection to communism and how looking at what historically has happened in what's been called communism might not necessarily be the thing Marx talked about, mm -hmm. which is not trying to say that I think communism is a superior system i think if history has taught us one thing is that capitalism was way better at adopting to these the needs of the laborers as they were in order to accommodate those needs within it in order to make it worthwhile working in this system 
that's why there was not this huge uprise in laborers um, not wanting to work anymore and rising up against their quote unquote masters. Yeah, capitalism rewards taking risks and investing heavily and investing more than the competition. So it's more competitive inherently, which is going to drive up just the total resource output. People want to work harder if it's going to dramatically improve their chances. If it's not going to change your station, whether you work really hard or if you half ass it, then why would you work hard? Or work at all for that matter. True. People, I would say they have a lot of sense of purpose from their work. They don't always like it, but at the end of the day, you feel like you did something. If people have been unemployed and stuff, uh, it's often a really frustrating, difficult time for people rather than when you're a kid growing up, you think like, oh, you don't have to go to work and you can just play video games. That's awesome. But humans need a purpose. Like you, or at least you need to have some sense of your reality where you feel like you're being fulfilled that your time is being well spent because we have limited time. And some people, if they've done some work that day, they know they've helped some people or they've moved some process along and they've made change to their environment. And that feels satisfying. An example that I know from growing up was mowing the lawn. It looks kind of scuffed and wild whenever it's time to mow it. And then once you take care of it, cut it to the right level, you weed it an edge, you make it look nice around the edges. At the end of that, you can look at your work and it looks fantastic. And that feels really fulfilling. Maybe you got paid a certain amount of money. Maybe you, maybe that's your job in the house. It feels nice. For certain stuff like say StarCraft play, being a pro StarCraft player, sometimes you drop your Oligulac rating because you lost in a tournament and you ended up with a negative after you put in amount of work. There are certain other fields that are like that too. Poker is like that. Um, any field where you're doing really unpleasant stuff, like there are a lot of negatives that come with it when you get paid. There are lots of different ways that humans can work, which makes this conversation really tangled and difficult to approach, I think. And probably why he needed to be so verbose. Yeah, it's not an easy subject, but it's, I think his criticisms of the times are still very valid. Mm. There, many of them are still active cases where it's, um, were to some degree abusing labor markets in other countries in order to get cheap shoes, for example. Mm. or the example with the the coffee where we, we want to get coffee that is cheap but also we want to have we don't want to actively starve um the coffee producers so it's it becomes kind of this moral questions of how we're spending our money and how we're valuing the labor of others and this is where the way Marx is discussed nowadays in this, um, basically we're, it's been looked at as a duality between capitalism and Marxism, mm -hmm. which is presented as two sides of a coin, which is just not the case. So there's a lot of Marxist aspect in capitalism, and there's also a lot of capitalist um, aspects in communist countries nowadays so th they're intertwined they're not two sides of a coin but it's presented this way just because we like it to to have this sense of the enemy uh, something we talked about before where we we want to know the other and the other uh, being presented as dangerous so we want to understand it in a sense of all right we need to be scared of communism or we need to be scared of something else because it's different from us and this is not the value we aspire to mm -hmm. which is not helpful in a philosophical sense it might be helpful if you just don't want to think about um, politics too much but i don't think politics get better if you use less of your brain that might just be my opinion though 
the thing that I remind people to avoid doing is when you directly parrot what someone on TV said, you lose your own internal voice of not just what they said, but what it meant and then how it relates to you and the situation you're in that conversation with someone else. The language should adapt and change because if you just copy paste stuff directly, that's how a lot of people just get indoctrinated and they end up all being on the same page with stuff without really critically thinking about it for themselves because every person has their own issues that they have to deal with. Like these are your pain points for your livelihood. This is the job you have and these are the struggles that you have with that job. These are the things that you want to vote for and have changed as a citizen. Society is super complex and people have a lot of different locations they're driving from. Yeah, Marx tried to break down some of it, at least. Made some pretty big changes to the conversation, you would say. We didn't really study this too much in, uh, I guess I didn't really take much philosophy in university. But Karl Marx, yeah, he's seen as sort of a, a crusty old guy who made a villainous ideology that caused the rivalry of the world, but he just wanted to do philosophy, probably. He wasn't really connected with governments or anything, no? Uh, no, he was not really liked uh, during his time. Like the governments were mostly run by those who had the the power and the finances. So someone coming up with the idea of maybe you should distribute wealth better, you're not making any friends. Right. The rich people, the kings and the queens and the aristocrats or whatever, they don't want to talk about and negotiate them having less money and you getting more. <laughs> Excuse me, you're getting too much money. We think that you should give us more money. Well, I won't give you money, but I could get you some cake. <laughs> In my experience, the cake is usually a lie. Hmm. Did he have problems in academia? Was he well received at the time? Um, he wasn't working in academia. He was, oh, let me try to remember this. He was working as a journalist for most of his life or most of his earlier life. And then he was um, Engels, which whom he wrote um, the Communist Manifesto, which is kind of this pamphlet about why we should be communist and this was kind of this war paper that was aimed at the proletariat to kind of start this revolution which did not happen as he anticipated um so he was working as a journalist and he was kind of um revolutionizing um how journalism was done by being on the spot so he went um to a worker uprise at a factory and he reported what was happening right there rather than just writing about it he was writing from what's happening which was not the first time someone did this but he really had this style about it and he was famous for that type of journalism at first hmm. and then this is a, an aspect um, I didn't touch on, but I wanted to. Um, there's this theory, and it, this really just is a theory, but it kind of makes sense, and it's kind of fun to consider. Um, during the Middle Ages, most of what people drank had some um, some trace amounts of alcohol, at least. Um, be it beer or cider, like in order to keep beverages um, from going bad, it's a lot easier to to have them be have a bit of alcohol in them. So wine, cider, beer, all of those are. It works as a preservative. Yeah, it, they're easy to produce, and it's harder to make wine and store it than it is to get fresh water all the time depending on where you live so the theory goes that up until sometime in the 
16, because it's the 17th century, it was common to be drunk a bit all the time because it was the, the easiest beverage to get by had some amounts of alcohol in it. And this somewhat changed with um, the rise of coffee culture and coffee having a similar um, addictive um, nature to it than alcohol has, where it's, it gives you a completely different stimulus. Coffee's got to go get him energy. Have a cup of coffee. Let's get going. We're moving. It's an upper. Alcohol is a downer. People get more lethargic, maybe more relaxed so you could engage with people and be not quite as stressed about it, not quite as anxious. So that could be a social plus for some people. But yeah, in terms of just the way that it interacts with the human body, caffeine's going to drive you to work more for sure. Yeah, so the theory goes that the rise in coffee culture is what enabled the uh, industrial revolution in the first place where people had a different mindset about how to approach problems because they were on a completely different stimulus and as i said i don't know how true this is but i find it, it an interesting thing to consider mm -hmm. and, and um looking at the, the timeline of kind of when coffee became widely available it does make sense as a fear, mm -hmm. but it doesn't just come out of thin air. There's a spice in the stew. Um, no, I kind of lost my train of thought on how we got onto this. Well, we've been going for a good bit. We're at about. 3 a.m. my time, nine hours, 10 minutes streamed. We did a value theory we're talking about for people who just came in from the raid. We've talked about like, what is value? What is money? What is people's time worth? How is the exchange between businesses and the employees in terms of the exchange of who gets the profits and what's left over and that kind of thing. But it's a, a set of really interesting questions that are so difficult to approach because every person's vantage point is unique. So what's going to benefit them? You can put people into more or less categories and get the averages and that kind of a thing. But as technology is shifting dramatically, businesses are changing and what they do. And it's really hard to quantify like what everything is worth. But Mark's definitely... He took a stab at it, a very weighty stab. I wouldn't even say a stab. It's like a, a steamroller of philosophy <laughs> with how he approaches stuff. It's a lot of pressure of addressing every possible thing and being really thorough with how he presents it. Who would be yeah, a, a, a contrast of him philosophically? Like what philosopher would have the opposite approach and writing style, but be similarly a big name? Uh, Nietzsche is always a good example of this kind of out there writing style of just I'm just throwing something at the wall and see if it sticks and if it sticks it's probably a banana and I'll sell it for 130k <laughs> Nietzsche shoots from the hip absolutely nice um, not always like he he starts out in this kind of Kantian tradition of writing but as he goes, he realizes this is not helping anyone. This is not fun to do. And if there ought to be a point about writing philosophy, it should be fun for the writer. Or at least that's, that's was his line of thinking. So I, I remember how we got onto this. And I kind of want to re uh, wrap this up with <clears throat> talking about um, what Marx did. So he was a journalist. Then through this coffee culture which was um, highly established. He met other people, other thinkers um, that were dealing with similar problems during the same time. Also, um, thinkers that were approaching the same problems from very different angles. So, but th there was this, this rich movement of thinkers kind of um, looking at their work and debating their work with others. Um, criticizing the work of others and 
so he met Engels at a coffee shop and as part of a group of left-leaning thinkers from, from uh, our perspective nowadays. Mm -hmm. And Engels pushes him to 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 get to conclusions from his um, his abstraction of he wants him to package it yeah exactly and Engels after that after they met and they start writing together he Engels was from a quite rich family so he was one of the um, of those capitalists or son of one of those capitalists and he enabled Marx to live a good life like financing him and his family for the rest of his life because Marx as good as he was analyzing money in the abstract he was terrible with money himself meaning he was just spending it in a kind of irresponsible way yes doing what <sighs> good question i can't really answer is it tos <laughs> um he was a family man so i don't think it would be something tos i assume he would um he would just live above his means where uh, it's yeah if I have a lot of money coming in, I'm going to buy all the most expensive stuff that I can for the categories. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Living the high life. You can't really save very well if you're living the high life and whenever your pay gets bumped up. If you want to save, you can cut the burn a little bit. Mark says, screw it. We'll get the biggest house best estate get the finest cheeses and wines <laughs> you can spend a lot of money it's easy to spend money that's the thing earning money is really hard spending it is relatively easy you can spend it a lot faster with lower effort it's really easy to spend money like there's so many things to spend money on it's i think having a it got increasingly difficult to to have a good money management on an individual level because you're constantly bombarded with hey buy this new thing or um get a loan for that new thing also you want to still pay off your student loan that you acquired because you thought this is the 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 best thing you could do so there's i think it got super difficult nowadays handling your money wisely mm -hmm. And the scale of money is higher than ever compared with hunter-gatherer society the wealthiest someone could be would be like a a king or an earl or something where you're the the local chieftain and you have more than the other chieftains nearby whereas now we have people who have entire countries worth of wealth in the money that shows up in a bank account that they could swing and that all their assets are worth so it's a different issue to kind of solve i think from a, a philosophical ethical standpoint from a value-based standpoint it's a much larger system now and a much more complicated system they describe economy as like a million dimensional system or something so comprehending that and then trying to shape that with the edges of philosophy in a way that people can benefit from big task so credit to marx for trying yeah I think the problem we have nowadays and two things we always had is we're trying to find easy solutions to very difficult problems and we want to be able to to break down um, economics in this case to a set of very basic principles which is not going to work out for the most part or it might work out for a time but we always realize, all right, this is this cannot reflect on the whole system. There's problems here, there's problems there. And this kind of analysis on the problematics of the current system during his time is what Marx did. 
and he's not getting much value for that. He's mostly being blamed for what happened a couple of years after he died in countries he had no relations to, which is kind of unfair in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So Karl Marx, maybe not the supervillain mastermind leader of multi-world governments, but more so someone who really wanted to do intense philosophy about some particular ideas. And then some other leftists at a coffee shop really pressured him into printing a bunch of pamphlets that could be used as propaganda. <laughs> and so we have the impression of Karl Marx versus the more robust and verbose approach of what is value theory? How do we ascribe value? What is people's time worth? What is the exchange of value like? Achei Fatum, thank you for helping us tackle another tangled topic, kind of comparing that one to Kant. What would be next in the sequence of philosophy clock after uh, value theory? You said the criticisms of it. Um, I think we should look a bit, or we can look a bit more at Kant's theories and how they developed, like looking at the practical aspect of um, this kind of economical and state philosophy. So this is where you can throw things at me like so many people died under communism compared to to any other system of government. <laughs> Something we could get into. We could also go back a bit, look at Hegel and how Hegel predicted that um, that Marx would be a thing without knowing Marx beforehand, just because he talked about this kind of um, struggle within society to to figure out what is best mm -hmm. um at some point we can look at nietzsche like there's there's still plenty of things to talk about sweet so we got so, more kant marx nietzsche uh not kant hegel hegel sorry no worries <laughs> um, so one kind of closing thought I want to give to people that are still skeptical of, of Marx and his kind of project and what he was about, which is fair because that's the kind of narrative you're, you're being fed all the time, um, growing up, I think, especially in the U S but also everywhere else where it's kind of like, all right. Communism is this bad ideology that will hurt people more so than help them. And as I'm saying, some of these criticisms are fair, some of them are not. But if you want to look at a really good contemporary analysis of problems arising from a capitalist society and why they're taking place the way they're doing, you could look at the price of inequality. It's a book published, I want to say, 15-ish years ago by a an American uh, economist. And he basically writes, what is the, the social cost of having a society that drifts apart in the same way that Marx was looking at basically the same problem, but with a another distribution at his time. Mm -hmm. And it's really a good read. It's he writes a lot more um, concise than Marx did. Uh, yes, Joseph Stiglitz and 2012 in that case. It's a good book. Nice. Not quite Karl Marx level verbose. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to get to that level. But I think for the document that you shared, it had references and things in it like that. If you're doing like a formal philosophical paper, are you meant to do that? Like you have all those, I'm referring to this here kind of thing. It's more of a scientific document. Well, this was in a time where where science and philosophy were a lot more intertwined. Like the way we think of philosophy nowadays, it's philosophy is this kind of out there weird subject that you could also study um, at university, but you since you will not make any money from it, why should you? Which 
is a fair case. <laughs> but philosophy used to be this critical analysis of what is, what could be, what should be, which are two very different things. And out of philosophy, there was this um, development into what we now consider to be the, the scientific method. So philosophy kind of um, shaped the structures that we now consider to be science, but at the same point, separating itself from it because it was not, it doesn't have the same, um, it's not as easy to quantify as all swans being white, which turned out not to be the case. So it also it's, doesn't it's, generate a, a daily consumable product that people could get. Like transporting an apple, you're an apple transporter person. That's cool. Philosopher, you're making really interesting kind of intellectual progress for humanity, which for a specialized species that's a really awesome thing to do but yeah how do you make money from philosophy or should you make money from philosophy <laughs> i would think philosophers would like it being a question just leaving it at that <laughs> well i would argue there's there definitely is value in philosophy otherwise i wouldn't do it uh how to make money from it is a different question. In my experience, people making money from philosophy nowadays um, do so by being um, very, um, how would you call that? They're being very polarizing. And this, I think, is not necessarily helpful for philosophy in itself. Because um, arguing purely to the extreme of one side of the spectrum might give you a lot of reader because they agree with you and they're willing to, to pay you money to get um, their worldview reinforced. But it's not in the philosophical tradition where you're just trying to look at it sober and be like, all right, there's aspect of this side, there's aspect of the other side. In the end, we just don't know which is kind of reflected in all of Plato's dialogue, where it's, what is friendship? I don't know. I don't know either. All right, maybe it is something, maybe it's not. We just don't know. But it was interesting considering it. Yeah. It is technically progress. Like you could say going into a direction and realizing you can't make any more progress is laying the philosophical groundwork which has a lot of value because then that tells other people, okay, this has been investigated and we can learn from this. And then now we can go in these other directions. I would hope that I have value in philosophy for having a regular segment and a playlist on YouTube. Because <laughs> we could be laddering, but we're philosophizing instead. Thank you chat for joining us. And if you have any questions or comments in the YouTube video, We'll keep an eye on those. You can ask about this or that or suggest any concepts that you would like to be talked about. We've talked about identity. Here we have value. Uh, we've been going mainly chronologically in order of the philosophers from the very oldest ones to more recent. So now we're in, what's the time frame of Marx writing? Industrial Revolution? Uh, Marx left between 1888 and 1883 so 19th century so it's the industrial revolution was has already kicked in so he saw the 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 result of what happened to laborers through the industrial revolution mm. Well, cool. Thank you, Eche Fatim, for guiding us through this complex web of information. I will say bravo. You made me laugh multiple times with like the situation. The video is really funny. The comparisons of the 
different items and the banana stuck to the wall. Man, I'm never for gonna forget that. That's crazy. I cannot believe that guy did that. What a flex. <laughs> and he said he would do it again. Maybe he just really likes bananas. He likes the attention he gets from eating that particular banana for that much money. People can get attention. If you need attention, chat. Love you, fam. YouTube, love you too. Eche Fatum, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for dedicating your time to teaching us about this. I'm glad that you're uninjured, big time. That was quite the fall. I'm glad you got HD video of that. And it was a good fall. Like, falling is a skill, you could say, as well. Is being able to collapse in such a way that you're not dealing the most damage. You get milliseconds to kind of intuitively process how you should react to that. And then you have also the preparation check of, did I wear a helmet? Were you wearing a helmet? Yes, I was wearing a helmet and protection on my knees and elbows. Some would say that was a good call. That your armor class was higher because you brought those things. Well, cool. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. thank you for tuning in at Schaefer Tomb. Thank you once again. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Good night, y'all. And that's Philosopher Clock with Etchafer Tomb. Thank you.